Hello, everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, we meet here to talk about photography with a different guest that helps us all connect, inspire, and create. You can find a schedule for our upcoming presentations on my website at lindanickel.com. If you haven't already subscribed to the Happiness Hour YouTube channel, please do so so that you don't miss any of the sessions. Tonight's guest is Lucy Ketchum. Lucy's love for flowers and photography have given her the skills to create beautiful, fine art floral prints. As an educator and mentor, Lucy offers an array of online classes. But in tonight's presentation, a close-up approach to flower photography, Lucy will share tips on how you can create beautiful floral images that are not macro or landscape, but what she calls a close-up approach. If you're on Instagram, look for her at lucy.ketchum and on her website at lucyketchum.com. I will link those in the show notes below. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Lucy. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be in your show. I know it's a great success, uh, <laughs> your show. And I have watched a few of the previous presenters, um, which I find very inspiring. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. I am thrilled that you, um, a lot of times, you know, I, I was telling Lucy earlier, uh, most of the people that I have on as guests, I do not know personally. Um, I have no blackmail on them. I don't know how to, I don't have anything to persuade them to come and do this. And they show up out of the kindness of their heart and they share what they know. And Lucy's one of those people. Um, it was just a, you know, I, I stumbled upon your page uh, in one of my feeds on Instagram, which is where I live. I live mm -hmm. in of there. Same. <laughs> they, yeah, I spend way too much time there, but something came across and it just caught my attention. And that always takes me down a rabbit hole. So I go to the bio page and, you know, tick, tick, tick. Oh, she does workshops. Well, let's just go to her website. And mm -hmm. uh, that's important. You know, if you have a website, you need to tell people you have a website because people like me, I don't want to say that I'm trolling because that sounds terrible, but I kind of am. And it, it takes you to, like somebody said earlier, before we started recording, he spent some time on your website and he's like, wow. And that's exactly, that was my reaction to your work. And I, I was tickled when you said, you're, you know, so we got you on the calendar and I'm very, very grateful. So I skimmed Thank over you. the bio. So is there anything you want to add to that before you get started? Feel free to. Okay, um, I think I'm going to share uh, my slide so we can get started. I have a little bit of um, about me and share a little more information if that's okay. So, Thank so you again for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to share uh, what I do, uh, which is flower photography. It's, uh, it's always funny that... Um, I don't call really myself a flower photographer uh, because I really don't know much about flowers, to be honest. So I just photograph them. So whenever people ask me about flowers and what type of flower is this or that, I have uh, trouble, you know, because I don't know a lot about flowers. I don't grow my own, own flowers. I wish I was more uh, into that, but, you know, I do what I can. So <laughs> with that, I'm going to get started. Um, so again, this is me. I'm Lucy Ketchum. I live in Houston, Texas. Um, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Mexico. Um, we moved to Houston about 17 years ago, and we have lived uh, here ever since. My kids basically grew up here. And I started with photography um, in 2008, more or less. So I was, you know, doing the math and it's 15 years ago. I was like, whoa, that long. <laughs> you know, my first uh, camera, uh, my husband gave it to me and I just started 
shooting anything that I could get my hands on. And then I started learning a lot about photography. I went to uh, Rice to take a, a few classes, photography classes. I've never done photography photography before, so it was like a whole new thing for me. Um, and I always loved to shoot flowers. There were a common, you know, theme in my learning about photography. Um, then I started after I learned like the basics and got more into photography. I started teaching uh, basics of photography to some groups of, you know, people that have a camera and, you know, wanted to learn how to use it. Then I moved a little bit to phone photography because everybody had a phone and everybody wanted to learn how to take better pictures with their phone. So I did that for a few years. And all the time I was, you know, still learning myself um, different, you know, photography techniques and practicing with my kids and with whatever I could. Um and at some point, um, my kids grew up, you know, and they weren't into photography anymore. And I really needed a subject to photograph and practice my photography and all of these things that I was learning. So, you know, I went back to flowers and I thought, OK, I, I will shoot flowers to keep learning until, you know, I find these um amazing subject to photograph i always thought doing portraits or street photography or travel photography um but i was mostly stuck at home with the kids so it was flowers for me that worked um so i spent a few years as a hobbyist um shooting flowers and what I want to um, share with all of you today is about my journey, how, um, you know, this became a thing, how I started, how I kept improving in this process, because I know we all are in a different stage. If, if you love to shoot flowers, um, maybe something from the journey will inspire you. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by sharing with you my first, um, some of my first flower pictures. Uh, I was, um, you know, in this stage that I was learning how to blur the background. So I was mostly trying to get a very sharp focus in the flower and then blur the background. So I have basically two subjects in my frame, the flower and the blurred background, and that was it. So not a lot of story there, but I was very into getting a sharp focus. And I would go outside, find any flower that I would see and then take a picture of it. And I was, um, you know, trying to take the best picture of these flowers. So I had two goals in mind. One was the flower to get it sharp. The other was to have a good, plain, blurred background. So not a lot of story there. Um, at some point, I began to be a little more intentional in my subject. So I will go out and try to find some interesting subject that could add a little bit of story in my images. So I, I wasn't really uh, sure about storytelling yet because I was learning mostly like the technical aspects of photography, light and focus and composition a little bit. So, but I was trying to be a little more um, intentional in my subjects. I came with this idea of doing a series called Beauty in the Ugly. So I went, um, and this is all in my backyard. Uh, I went to my backyard and found these, you know, interesting looking subjects that maybe could tell a little story and 
also practice with my photography. Again, all of this was just me practicing my photography. This wasn't really going to be my thing, the flower photography. Um, so next, um, at some point uh, I became, um, let me move these, I'm sorry, I'm trying to uh, look at everything at the same time. Um, I came across this uh, phrase, if you want to get better at photography, stop shooting flowers. And I was like, whoa, that really hit hard because I was so into flowers and trying to, you know, get these beautiful subjects in my frame. And I was like so confused when I read these. And it was from a, you know, well-known photographer. It, was, it wasn't said to me. I just read it. And I understood that good photographers don't shoot flowers. That's the way I, you know, understood it. So... I said, okay, I need to do something else because if I keep shooting flowers, I will never be good, right? So I started to shoot other things like portraits and my kids and I would put my kids here and there and they were at some point tired of me. Um, I would do street photography and, you know, oh, I, I tried a little of everything, but I always came back to flowers. So I said, okay, I need to make this work and I will just keep doing this because it was easy for me having kids at home to just keep shooting flowers. I will come back to this phrase uh, a little later on in this presentation. So then I got my first macro lens um, and I fell in love. Obviously, I mean, it was amazing for me to be able to get super close to the flower and get these, um, you know, all these details and that changed the world for me. It was it was incredible. I would go and shoot and whatever flower, it, it didn't matter what flower it was, as long as I could get super close to it and get all the details. Of course, you can see that it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't getting like the best angle or, you know, the prettiest flower. Um, I was just into getting very, very close. Um, it was very fun to me to learning about macro. I took a workshop and I was, you know, very into macro. Um, the only thing that happened to me is that I never learned or applied uh, the more advanced techniques of macro, um, because I'm not that detailed, I guess, in my photography, that technical, I'm more kind of carefree, I want to say. And so those techniques, very advanced, um, I, they never worked for me. So at some point I was like, okay, how many more details I can get of a flower, right? So I was like, I think I have to do something else. So I began backing up a little bit and integrating a little more, you know, um, subjects in my thing. Um, it was um, trying to create a little more story with repetition, with layering, still you know, paying a little more attention to my background, um, but I mean, not a lot of variety in my frame. And I was beginning to apply more of the rule of thirds, uh, repetition, um, trying to get this attempt of uh, flowers in the wild, because that's where what I wanted to recreate. Um, what I wish was really to be in this beautiful meadow full of flowers growing all the time, but I wasn't. I really live in a very cookie cutter community that, you know, plain backyards, few flowers here and there, sometimes of the year, not, you know, year round. So I, 
I wanted to recreate mostly this uh, feeling of being, you know, out there in a beautiful meadow. I remember I took a class around this time with a portrait photographer that um, she she created this beautiful, like, um, it was family, but it was like couples, uh, very lifestyle in these, you know, beautiful places. And I took a class and I learned everything was posed. And I was like, wow, everything is posed. Like in my mind, there were moments that were happening and she was able to capture the moments. But she was so good at doing that, that she really fooled you. So I thought, okay, maybe I can, you know, do something like this with my photography. Like I'm not in this beautiful field of flowers, but maybe I can make my viewers believe they are looking at that. So that's when um, this thing of a close-up approach, um, even though I didn't know it yet, started for me. Then I discovered something called light. And this became my thing. Like today is still my thing. When I discover light and how to use light and how important light is in your images, these, um, you know, a lot of things changed for me. I became obsessed. I'm a little obsessed when I find new things, as you can see. So I apply this thing and I only do that thing, which is not a bad idea when you're, you know, wanting to get better at something, you learn a new thing, and then you apply that thing for a long time. So I became obsessed with light, and I wanted to shoot in golden hour all the time. So I went around my neighborhood to find anything that could be included in my images. So it wasn't, you know, the best subjects, or I wasn't to trying to create something so special. I was just obsessed with light. And it's beautiful, but my subjects were not the center of the photograph. It was the light. And I still love these images. And I think learning about light was one of the things that changed um, everything for me. So this was my light uh, face and also trying to um, create that flare, sunburst, um, anything that I could work around um, light. Uh, it helped me to also work with aperture. So learning about shallow or deep, uh, closed, open, like whatever, um, differences there were in using different apertures. Um, then I discovered Lens Baby. And Lens Baby was a big phase uh, in my flower photography. I think a lot of flower photographers uh, use Lens Baby. I got the Lens Baby Velvet 56, which I still have to this day. And that gave me these, you know, um, opportunity to be more creative. Um, so I, I was already using light. So I think combining with the lens baby, the use of light that I already was into helped me to create some, you know, these dreamy looking images that I was very into and, um, I became more aware of the subject and the light. So again, I went a little back to subject and light and blurry background. So as you can see here, I again have these, but more dreamy looking um, images. I kept doing this for a while. Uh, I wanted to recreate uh, this painterly style that I have seen elsewhere and I was very into. And the more I did it, I, I loved it, but I found that it wasn't me, that I was just trying to be and recreate some other people's style, which wasn't really me. So when something it's not coming from you, from what you like, what you love, 
it's very hard to do. So I, at some point, move away from these, but it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot and it gave me, you know, this opportunity to be creative. That was something that I was missing because I was being very technical. And these gave me that freedom to be more creative and artistic, like, let's say. Then at some point, I discovered how to do boca. And this is something that really, really changed me because to this day, I love boca. I, I became obsessed with it when I discovered how to um, create boca, how to find it, how to include it in my images. So you can see here how most of the images here are about the boca and less about the subject. So I was so obsessed about it that I, I didn't care a lot about the subject. It was right in the middle, but with beautiful boca. So this face was more about the background than the subject. So it was a little backwards, uh, but it was good. I mean, I, I feel like being able to create boca, find boca, which I, which I love, um, it's really a skill. It, it's a skill that you have to work um, to get. So this was a good time. I really enjoyed it. I was again shooting during sunset. As you can see here, I'm still obsessed with that light. Sunset light is my favorite light. And I learned everything. I did some um, with different lenses, with my macro lens, with my lens baby. So I was using different lenses to create this different style of bokeh in my images. Um, I would shoot anything that, I mean, any subject was a good subject as long as it had bokeh. <laughs> so I, I was in love of the different type of bokeh that you could create with, you know, using water or using, you know, bounce light, anything that would create bokeh, I was into that. Then I started to back up a little bit again. Um, I returned to that phase with new tools, new use of light, integrating bokeh, adding a little more elements to the frame again, going back to being in that beautiful field of flowers, which I loved. Um, but now with these new tools, I guess my images really improved. Uh, adding repetition, uh, creating layers to create dimension. That's something that I started to pay attention to. And that really changed my photography. Um, so I started to um, include more elements in the frame, not only one subject and the background. So I was, okay, I need to create a, a bit of more of a story into my images. I know how to use light. I know how to create bokeh. I know about depth of field and all these technical aspects. Now I was more into creating a story. So including more elements into the frame helped me to create more of a story. I will go to my backyard with a bunch of little flowers and stick them in different places that had like beautiful greenery or some interesting thing going on with some, you know, plants or sticks or whatever I could find and adding them to my story. This was a very important phase um, in my photography because it gave me the freedom to, again, shoot at home, use elements that I had at home, but I also started buying flowers because at some point I was like shooting the same flowers over and over again because I didn't have a lot of variety here at home. So I went to the grocery store, got a bunch of little flowers and then play with them in my backyard.
So um, when doing these, I was shooting either with my lens baby or my macro lens. I had heard before about um, freelancing and I was very curious. Um, I had tried it before, but it didn't really work. It was after using lens baby that I got that feeling and that um, effect of the dreaminess. So I tried Lens Baby again, I mean, freelancing again, and I totally fell in love. I ditched all of my other lenses and stuck with freelancing from there on. Um, I, I just fell in love. I fell in love how to create, how it creates this dreamy bokeh, how I can include flair with the light and all the layers and softness around my images. At this time, I was more aware of my subject. So I was selecting my subjects better, paying a little more attention to how the subject looked, how it was positioned in the frame, a little more story with other elements and the light, of course, always, always part of my frame. So I would go outside every day uh, with flowers bought from the grocery store, uh, walked around my home to find the best light possible during sunset uh, at different times of year. It changes because the sun shifts. Uh, it was at different times that I, I needed to go out. I had to get ready in time to be, you know, in time for the sunset. And um, this is where I think things really, really change for me. I learn about a lot about light, about the season, where the light is coming from, where it bounces, um, how light changes the mood of your picture. And um, it was one of the best exercises I've done. Uh, to do this almost for a whole year. I really suggest that if you want to get good at using light, do something like this, uh, a light exercise when where you're shooting one subject that it's easy to photograph and focus on the light and how to really use the light and practice with different lenses and all of that. And this would, this for me was really a game changer, uh, learning about the light. And then I began to be more aware of my subject, of the positioning of my subject in the frame, how it relates to the other elements. What are the other elements contributing to my to my frame, to my images? How are they all telling a story? Um, my subject um, was now only part of the story, not the main thing in my frame. Um, I began to create more layers. Uh, I, I began to be more intentional of where to put every single element inside of the frame. And that I think this was a time where I really felt that I was creating images that um, were able to transport my viewers to a beautiful field of flowers. So I was finally happy where I was at this point. And I think this is mostly uh, what led me to where I am I today. So, story became more important than my subject. So finally, my photography, I was able to tell more of a story instead of I'm shooting this subject in this beautiful light. Um, so I'm here, I'm um, more aware of each of all of the elements. How are each of these elements contributed to the composition, to the story? Um, how they help me frame and keep the viewer engaged in the image. My light is always, always part of the, my image. My light is part of the story. I like to tell stories of um, 
this beautiful sunset and you are outside looking at these beautiful flowers during sunset. At this point, I also began shooting more uh, vertical. Um, I felt that with flowers, it gave me more space to include more elements in my frame because I wanted to include the main element, but also my light. So shooting vertically gave me that opportunity to create more space and have all of these elements inside of my frame. And this is where am I today? Um, at some point, I decided that I didn't really want to be a moody photographer, like moody flowers, although I love that style. It's not really me. I'm more like a, um, you know, happy colors, vibrant. So I changed a little bit my, I think my editing has evolved uh, in time. And right now it's more of a happy colors and bright light. Um, I also decided to add some whimsical touch to my images, even more elements. Uh, so I add, I started adding some fairy lights that you can see here. So it's not only about the elements in the frame, the flowers or the light. It's just adding an extra touch to my images. And um, I did these uh, a long time. Adding these um, fairy lights was really part of my photography for a long time. Um, after using these fairy lights, I decided to do my own overlays because I thought, well, it would be easier to just add them in post-processing. And so that's what I did. I created some overlays and I still use them like in all of my images to this day. Um, I also started very recently, like, you know, end of last year, uh, to blend images together. So I will have this one image, but I wanted to create more with my images because I usually have sets of images, right? So I have, you know, when I shoot outside, I have like, you know, I shoot like a hundred images, not all of them are usable, of course, but I have a few that are not perfect, but still, you know, usable. So I started to do this, um, creating these images from blending different images. So this is an example of that. Um, and I don't shoot thinking of these. This is the thing. So I kind of shoot thinking of each image as a good standalone image. But then if I'm editing, I can see, oh, this one will go good with this one. And it's always from the same shoot because you have, you know, it's better to have the same light, the same type of white balance and lighting and coloring and flowers, of course. So I do these with the same set of images. I just you know, blend a few together and come up with uh, new images all together. This is another example. And this one has uh, several images blended together along with some overlay. So a little more, you know, extra, extra, extra elements. And I don't know, at some point, I'm going to have to stop adding so many elements into my images. So these are examples of um, images that I'm now taking with, um, for the longest time I was shooting with a Nikon D800 and um, the lenses that I mentioned and for my freelancing, the 50 millimeter lens. I recently got these, uh, the Canon R5 mirrorless with a 35 macro lens. That's what I'm using today and I love it. So I'm not doing a lot of freelancing lately. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun with this macro 35. I think it, it's a perfect lens for flowers because it let, lets you get as close as you want, but it also gives me this space that I need 
to create my floral scenes. So adding more elements into the frame. So something that I suggest that anybody that's shooting flowers is back up a little bit and include more elements, tell a little more of a story with your images. So um, going back to that phrase that I told you about, I now understand after five years of shooting flowers, what it means. It wasn't a mean comment at all. It's just to think a little more about your subject. So shooting a flower, it's easy, right? It's You already have the pretty subject, um, but a pretty subject doesn't make a photograph. In order to make a photograph, you need, you need good light, composition, color, creativity, storytelling, evoking emotions. There's a lot more into a photograph than just a pretty flower. So this is how I now interpret that phrase. And I think it makes a lot of sense. The only thing is he didn't explain it. So <laughs> it wasn't as clear the first time. Um, so when my thinking, when I create my images now is what is the story I want to tell? Is it a happy story? Is it a sad story? Is it joyful? Is it spring or is it winter? Um, think about your narrative um, beforehand, before you create an image. Think, what do you want to say? What story do you want to tell? Even if it's a single flower, you don't have to create images like this. It's just thinking of what story do you want to tell? Let your emotions also influence your creation because sometimes we are thinking too much about the technical aspect. Where is the light coming from? All of those things that I talked about, but we forget about how are we feeling? How are those feelings going to affect our images today? So that's something that I suggest that we all have to do. Um, let me go now to some tips that I want to share with you. Um, so important technical things to consider when you're shooting flowers, and these are very basic things, but they are so powerful. Make sure your subject is clear and in good position. So it, with flowers, it's very easy. And even if I go back to my own work, I can find that I wasn't paying attention to this. So what I mean is decide which of your flowers, if you're shooting a bunch of flowers, is going to be your main subject. Make it that be in better position than any other flowers. Make sure that your subject has the best light and it's in focus. So it's very easy to have like the main flower and other you know, elements inside of the frame, and then the focus landed on some other flower or in some other place. So that takes away, of course, um, from our main subject. And though some, um, some tips that I consider every time that I shoot, and this is something that I have learned um, from all of my journey as a flower photographer, uh, of course, composition is a most to think. Um, think about where are you placing the flowers and all the elements. How are you arranging the elements inside of your frame? So make um, decisions on how are these elements positioned inside of your frame. Use different angles to create a nice background and framing. So moving a little bit. Changing your angle will affect your background. So are you going to include more light or less light? Um, what other elements are you going to include? So changing the angle a little bit will affect these and will affect your framing as well. Um, light, I mean, light can be a subject on its own and I can talk about light for a long, long time, but I mean, very short few tips that are good. I think it's 
avoid bright light. And it's very common to have these in flower photography because we are outside during midday or when the sun is shining very hard. And it's better to wait until the light is better. I mean, light in any type of photography. And these tips are for any type of photography, but I think they apply to flowers as well. Um, so I prefer to shoot during golden hour. And if I have to shoot during, you know, midday or during the day, I prefer an overcast day. And then I can, you know, add dimension and color and warmth in my post-processing. Um, focus and depth field. Um, this is a concept that it, I use all the time. Uh, I like to create dimension in my images. Um, I like to my viewer to feel that they're looking into the horizon to this beautiful field of flowers. So for these, uh, depth of field is very powerful. Um, use your aperture and decide how much of your um, elements you want you know, in focus. I don't use the widest aperture because I find that this gives me a very, very thin focal plane. So I prefer to have a little more focus. So 1.8 to 2.5 is my preferred aperture. Of course, it depends on the lens that you're using and how close you are to your subjects. But play around a little bit with the aperture and decide which one works best for you. Also think about color and contrast. Um, how does color affect your the mood of your, your photographs? What type of colors do you prefer to photograph? Um, what type of flowers in what colors? I prefer a little more softer tones that, than very bright. I find that very bright tones are hard to edit. Um, but that's personal preference also. It's it's about all about your style. What are your favorite colors? Um, what is the mood that you want to um, define through color? And for that, I use color theory because I think um, it gives me a very good tool to, to find out what you know, if I have two flowers of different colors, which colors go better together? So color theory is a very powerful uh, tool to understand that. Uh, texture, I um, I use texture um, in my backgrounds. For example, I like to add other elements where I have empty spaces. So I, I avoid now uh, having empty spaces in my images. So I prefer to add more elements to add a little more texture. Um, I like soft texture in my background, but also detailed texture, sharp texture in my main subjects. What are, how are you combining these textures together? And of course, um, emotion and storytelling is something that we should all add to our work. Okay. Uh, oh, lastly, my gear, as I said, I, for the longest time, I used um, Nikon D800. That was my go-to camera. I still use it a lot. It's very old now, but it's still going. Uh, with a 50 millimeter lens for freelancing, I suggest if you want to try freelancing to use the very cheapest one, because if not, it's going to be heavy. So it's better to hold a very um, light lens. So my lens is a 1.8 and it also has the aperture ring in the lens. So this is the very, the cheapest 50 millimeter that you can find. It's the best for freelancing. Mm -hmm. And now I'm shooting with a Canon R5 uh, with a 35 millimeter macro. So that's my gear and that's what I use for my pictures.
Lucy, let me interrupt you real quick. Um, yeah. I think we've got it figured out in the room, but um, you use the phrase free lensing. Can and a lot of people have, are not familiar with that term. Can yeah. you just kind of briefly describe it in the technique? Sure. Um, and sure. I will. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so free lensing is uh, detaching the lens from the camera and holding the lens very close to the camera so you can actually move the lens a little bit. So you hold it, you detach it, you hold it close to the camera and you make slight movements. So those movements, what it's going to do is uh, to create an opening, right? Between the camera and the lens and the light will come through those openings. So it depends how you move it. It also helps to act a little bit as a macro lens. So when you detach, for example, the 50 millimeter, it will get you closer, let you get closer to your subject. Um, the thing with freelancing is the camera is not able to meter the light because the lens is detached, right? So you have to meter first the light, set your settings, so your shutter speed, your aperture, your ISO, and then detach the lens. You can adjust as you go because those settings are not going to be perfect because since you're detaching the lens and some light is going to come through, you're going to have a little more light than the camera first meter for. So, I mean, you learn as you go to adjust. I always, always underexpose a little bit because I know I'm getting more light from having the lens detached. So another quick question I'm going to insert. Mm -hmm. um, there was discussion. Um, do you do free lensing with your mirrorless camera? I don't. No, that's a very good question. And I should clarify that because um, first of all, I've heard it's not good <laughs> to do free lensing with mirrorless cameras. Um, and for that, I have my other camera. Mm -hmm. And then with the 35 millimeter, I really don't have to because that lens let me lets me get very close to my subjects. So I don't really need to uh, do the free lensing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Um, that's yeah. it for my part. Well, on the gear, um, and maybe you'll get to it, but Linda was curious, um, do you use any filters? I don't, no. So my gear is only these, so the camera and the lens. <laughs> I don't use a tripod. I don't use filters. Um, I have learned to, um, you know, set my settings the way um, that I know it's going to work for the best light. So underexposing, it's always my go-to because I want to preserve that bright light at the top. That's my main, you know, goal because I'm still shooting in good light, even if it's sunset light. I still have good light overall in my flower. So I can recover in my post-processing um, a little bit of that underexposed um, elements. You, you know, any questions that anybody has? I'm Perfect. here okay. to help. Oh, great. I'm going to get you to take down your um, screen and then I'll ask you okay. a couple of questions that came through. Sure. Um, this has to do, so Ariel asked earlier, um, do you do camera multiple exposures at all or do you mostly do it in post? I do it in post. Um, I have tried multiple exposure and I, I really enjoyed it, but I, I feel I have, I don't have enough control in my, you know, ending image. So I prefer to do it in post. But as I said, um, I'm not shooting in my mind to do these double exposures in post. It just, you know, I choose the images that I feel go together after I shoot. So when I'm looking at them in my, you know, computer, I feel that, oh, this one can go together because I have an empty space here that I can fill with this other image. So that's 
how my thought process goes. Okay. Karen wants to know when you used to use the fairy lights, about how yeah. far back were they from your subject? Yes, um, they were kind of. I, I'm not good at measures. <laughs> um, uh, let me say two feet, three feet, like not very, very far, because if they're very, very far, they're going to look like a tiny little thing. So mm -hmm. just play around. It depends on your aperture. For these, you have to use like a, you know, wide aperture because you want them like out of focus, right? And, and, look bigger um so what i have is i have some bushes that i wrap the the fairy lights and then i put my flowers in front a few feet like three two to three not very far far and then i adjust depending on what i'm seeing through the viewfinder um luis's question is are most of your photographs taken outside or do you do any of your photography indoors? Uh, no, I mostly shoot outside. Um, I also, sometimes I do indoors when the weather is bad, you know, outside and, or it's windy, you know, there's some conditions that even if the sun is out or there's a beautiful sunset or mosquitoes are terrible, <laughs> sometimes in the summer, it's like horrible. So I, I, you know, I don't want to go outside during sunset. I will be eaten by mosquitoes. So yes, shooting by a window can work really well, but you need to put like a reflector, right? Because you won't have this light on this on this side of the window on the opposite side so you need to bounce some light back to the flowers that you're photographing but yes it, it really works too okay um i'm gonna say last call for questions so if you have any questions throw them in there but one from john is he is curious when you do your multiple exposures how are you how are they being merged are you doing hdr or focus stacking or no, no, I, I'm I'm not very, very good. At, I mean, I know how to use Photoshop, but I don't do those like techniques of stacking and all of that. I just place them on top in another layer. And then I decide what, you know, it's like painting. I decide this flower is going to be here. So I'm going to paint this flower from that other picture here. So it's more organic for me. It's just layering, layering in Photoshop and deciding what sections of that picture you want to show where in your image. Well, Lucy, um, there are a whole bunch of nice comments in here and I, I'll share that with you, the chat with you. Thank you. Thank um, you. This was such a delightful um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're in the middle of spring and it's just edging into the heat. And this was just so, it's such a pretty presentation. So I really enjoyed it. And um, thank you. Thank you all for being here. It was wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed sharing my journey. This is not something that I do, you know, all the time. I think, and I hope it was inspiring um, and, you know, Try to be as honest as I, can, as I can be. And, you know, wherever in your journey you are, you know, you can always, you know, improve and learn something new. And I, I really hope I keep learning myself and improving. Well, and I think to your story, just in the chats, people, it resonates because they've experienced very similar stories and that journey. And it's always about learning. It's always about, you know, the next layer of how can I do something better? You know, you learn exactly. your own tricks of your trade as you go along and the more practice and time you put into your craft, um, it, it shows in your work. And I, I think that that is such a, 
I don't know, uh, a reason to keep pushing forward because you're you're on the right track and you're really uh, inspiring a lot of people in this room tonight. So thank you for coming. Thank and you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and I also have workshops. If people want to learn more from me, I do one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions. So, you know, reach out and I will be more than happy to help. And I love what I do. So I hope um, <laughs> you're inspired so by that. Yeah, it makes it fun when you love what you're doing. Yes. All right, when you can connect with Lucy through her website, lucyketchum.com. And you can find her on Instagram at lucy.ketchum. And I'll link that in the show notes below. Next week, Willa Friedman will join us with her presentation, Pandemic fantasy. And please do not miss this because it's going to be kind of fun. Um, I uh, happened to be in Virginia and we walked into a bakery and I saw her work and my, the person I was with said, she's a friend of mine. And oh, I wow. <laughs> I'm getting her for this, uh, for the happiness hour. So she's going to be here next week, but until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again. Thanks. Soon.